Okay, well, we'll give you a chance um, after Dr. Bennett's talk to um, ask questions of everybody. So uh, now I get to introduce C. Frank Bennett. Um, otherwise, we call him Frank. He's a great guy. <laughs> Um, he um, is an interesting fellow. He has worked at a drug company since 1989, Ionis, and his uh, focus has been on how can we use these antisense molecules to attack disease. And in fact, Frank was I think helped in many ways by not only the HDF's activities, but many other researchers' activities. But together with collaboration, it was possible to actually show that they could affect uh, things in animals. <clears throat> now, the other thing that's really important uh, that I just wanted to tell you about is Frank just won the Breakthrough Prize. Now, the Breakthrough Prize. <laughs> many people think it's, uh, well, it's definitely better than the Nobel Prize because it's $3 million. And, uh, <laughs> but also uh, because uh, it really is defining people doing just cutting edge work. And he did not get it for the work on Huntington's. He got it for the work on spinomuscular atrophy, a horrible disease where children are born and start to become weak, either as infants or young children, and they lose the neurons going to their muscles and just become weaker and weaker until they can't walk, they can't speak, they are eventually die at about either the age of three or four or five. It's a fatal disease. He designed an ASO, antisense oligonucleotide, that worked. And there are now kids running around with that disease at six, seven, eight. He'll tell, he could tell you after you know his talk about Huntington's about this. It is a miracle. And it shows that if this can work in spinomuscular atrophy, it's gonna work in other diseases. And he's already trying it. So that's what's so exciting. And he is like uh, so awesome because he gives of his time to really um, work out how we're going to get this done for diseases that aren't maybe the most common disease in the world, but the diseases that are extremely important to many people. So, Frank, please. Maybe we ought to stop there. <laughs> So uh, thank you very much. That's uh, very kind. And uh, I do appreciate being invited to speak here today. It's uh, uh, very, a lot of fun to talk about some of the work that we've been doing. And now we're starting to see some of the benefit of that work uh, uh, come to fruition. And also, I should acknowledge that when Nancy asks you to do something, she's the godmother. And, and you never say no to, to Nancy. So uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, um, and so what I'd like to do is, is uh, go into a little bit more detail about uh, some of the uh, technology that Dr. Tillman uh, just spoke about. And just to remind you that uh, uh, our genes, and there's roughly 20,000 to 25,000 unique genes in the human genome, are made into an intermediate molecule uh, called RNA. And one way to think about this is the genes, the hard drive of your computer, where all this information is stored, it's translated, uh, transcribed into an intermediate molecule called RNA that goes away uh, over time. So it's, it doesn't hang around very long. And then that RNA is translated into proteins, which are the, the scaffolds and the enzymes and what make our body function. And so this has been referred to as the central dogma of life, is that DNA makes RNA, makes protein. And unfortunately, uh, some of the proteins that are made uh, are, are toxic. 
and will cause a disease. They can either be uh, genetically caused uh, uh, proteins, uh, such as Huntington, <clears throat> uh, that produce toxicity, or sometimes the cell uh, uh, makes modifications on proteins that, that, that cause them to be toxic. And, and so uh, as an industry, and I've been working in the pharmaceutical industry now for 35 years, our goal is really trying to uh, identify drugs that will interact with proteins. And there's really two classes of drugs that we uh, have traditionally thought about. One are, oh, that moved a little bit, but small molecules that will bind to protein. And these are drugs like Lipitor, aspirin. You know, we all take a, a number of different small molecule drugs that do bind to protein and uh, in, in impact the protein and will, oops, sorry, um, go back one. Uh, will we'll bind to the protein and, and we'll modify the disease. Uh, there's another class of proteins that's really coming to the forefront now called antibodies. And these are protein drugs themselves that bind to proteins, and we all have antibodies that we, we generate. But you can design antibodies to bind to proteins that will interfere with their function, and that's commonly used now in cancer therapy. In, in fact, uh, the, you know, a lot of the big excitement in cancer right now is because of the antibody-based therapies. Uh, they've been used for uh, inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, the TNF inhibitors that you may have heard about are, are examples of this. And, and so that's really a powerful technology for, for uh, uh, modulating uh, uh, disease-causing proteins in, in the body. Um, we, as a company, are, are taking a little bit different uh, 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 strategy. And what we're doing is uh, to design oligonucleotides or, or drugs that will bind to RNA. And remember, there's uh, 20 to 25,000 unique genes in the genome. We can design a antisense drug uh, shown here that will only bind to one of those. So we're only binding to one of the 20,000 genes, so it's a very selective way of uh, modulating function. Once the oligonucleotide binds uh, to this uh, RNA here, it uh, brings in an enzyme that causes the RNA to be degraded, and the net result is you don't produce the protein. So we're a little bit upstream of what uh, most traditional drugs do, in that uh, we're not binding to the protein itself, but what we're doing is preventing the protein from ever being made. So by reducing the amount of RNA, you reduce the amount of uh, toxic protein that, that's being produced in the cell. Uh, and that's really the basis for the technology that uh, we're working on. And that may sound very Star Warsy, and, and it probably does, is that, uh, you know, how, how in the world can you make all this work? And I can uh, show you that we've, we've been able to make it work. There are currently six approved drugs that use this technology today. Uh, and they range from a, a drug to treat a viral infection that was very prevalent during the AIDS epidemic, uh, a drug for cholesterol, the spinal muscular atrophy drug that uh, uh, Ann just mentioned a, a few minutes ago and I'll talk more about. And then a, a drug for another a very severe pediatric disease called Duchenne's muscular dystrophy that, that's being used. And then recently two new drugs have come on the market uh, for uh, uh, targeting a polyneuropathy. So it's a peripheral nerve uh, disorder that, that uh, uh, antisense drugs are really showing a lot of promise for. Um, and, and so what I'd like to do is just for a moment show you Spinraza because I think it has a lot of relevance to Huntington's disease. And uh, Spinraza is a drug that was approved about a year and a half ago by the FDA for uh, cell in, uh, in the United States. And, and so as Anne mentioned, SMA is a, what's called a motor neuron disease. So the, uh, the nerves that innervate your muscle become sick. And one way I, I kind of use as an analogy is if you think about an electric cord being plugged into an outlet, those are your nerves being plugged into the muscle. And when these nerves get sick, they sort of fall out of the socket. So the, the nerve hasn't completely died off, but it's not making the electrical connection, so you're not firing the muscle. And eventually these kids will uh, become paralyzed. So uh, the, the disease presents as a spectrum. Uh, uh, the, the most severe form of the disease is called type 1 SMA. And these are uh, infants or, uh, that generally present symptoms within uh, one to two months of life. Uh, they, they start losing their muscle function. And unfortunately, they have a very short life expectancy of uh, six months to a couple of years. And uh, um, uh, historically been called the floppy infant syndrome uh, today. There's another less severe form of the disease called type 2 SMA, uh, where they develop symptoms after six months of age, and they're able to sit, so they do have some function, and they'll live to their 20s for, uh, you know, and longer but they are severely impacted by the disease. The, they have uh, very severe contractures, they lose weight, and uh, uh, you know, don't have a high quality of life. But uh, 
you know, they do uh, have a, a fairly normal life expectancy. And then there's the type three kids uh, who, uh, again, have the ability to walk, but as they start uh, going through puberty and putting on a lot of weight, they stress out their muscles and they end up losing uh, uh, muscle tone. And so they lose the ability to walk later in life. And it really is a continuum. It doesn't really fit into you know, a, a specific category, but it sort of gives you the extremes of what we're looking at. Unfortunately, these uh, type 1 infants account for about 50% uh, of the babies born uh, will have this type 1 SMA. So that's the most severe form, and unfortunately, it's the most common uh, today. <coughs> So, we, as mentioned, we developed a drug for type 1 SMA, and what I'd like to do, rather than show you a lot of uh, numbers and, and graphs uh, showing the activity of the drug, is actually show you a patient that was treated. And so this is uh, Cameron, just to introduce you, uh, who is a type 1 SMA baby. Uh, he was uh, diagnosed uh, about seven weeks of age and went on the drug at eight weeks of age. And so what I'd like to do is show you his progression while on the drug. And so if you could start the video. Uh, so this is four weeks old, and looks like a relatively normal, healthy baby, although he's, he, he's not showing a lot of uh, movement in his uh, arms there. Um, by seven and a half weeks, he's clearly symptomatic. Uh, he can barely move his hands. Uh, and then we started on drug, and so by four and a half months, uh, so it's a couple of months after starting treatment, he's beginning to show some strength in his arms. Um, and you'll, you'll see, you know, at 12 months, a little bit more strength. Uh, getting better. Sorry. And then uh, this shows him at 16 months, so he's beginning to get some strength in his legs. And you'll notice that uh, he's, kids really don't have any neck control. Your head's pretty heavy for most of us, and so lifting up your head is hard. Uh, by 20 months, he's beginning to stand. Uh, and this just shows a, a picture at 26 months uh, uh, riding a horse. And by uh, 36 months, he's riding a tricycle. Uh, so it really does show what this drug has is, is done. And so just to remind you, uh, this was what uh, was anticipated that he would uh, have uh, become. It really, he would have been completely paralyzed by the time he's three years of age. And what we've done uh, with treatment is, I don't, I don't want to say we've converted them to a type 2, a less severe form of the disease, but it clearly uh, resembles a lot of the symptoms of a, a type 2 SMA. And this should point out that he's still on therapy, and uh, you can Google Cameron SMA and you'll see uh, the family post videos of their, their uh, child uh, fairly frequently. He's now beginning to walk uh, there. So really, we really don't know what, uh, uh, what he's going to turn into and what, what the, the future is in store for him but it was much better than what the future was before uh, this drug. And, and so that's why I'm personally excited about what we're doing in neurological diseases, that I, I really do believe that we can uh, have other examples like uh, Espinraza uh, that we're gonna have an impact on uh, a very severe neurodegenerative disease. And so what I'd like to do, and, and given uh, uh, the audience is, is turn my attention to Huntington's disease. And just to remind you, Huntington's, as uh, uh, Dr. Tillman pointed out, is a disease where there's an expansion of the CAG repeat uh, uh, within the, the, the genome to produce this uh, toxic protein. And generally, the way to think about it is the toxic protein becomes sticky. And so you get these large aggregates that, that, that bind and stick to, together, and they gum up the cell. And the cell can't really deal with them very well, and they end up uh, uh, becoming toxic uh, to the cell. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I do think it's worth noting, uh, today, this is the 50th anniversary of the Hereditary Disease Foundation. It's the 25-year anniversary since the discovery of the gene. Uh, and many of the people in this room, uh, there are several scientists in this room that were instrumental in the discovery of the gene, including uh, Dr. Wexler. Um, and uh, this is a uh, large group of people. And, and uh, one of the things that, that's really astounding is now that we have the human genome sequence, this took uh, fi over 50 people, 10 years or so, to, to be able to identify this gene. Today, scientists are discovering uh, genes that cause disease uh, every day. Uh, and and it, just with the, the, the expansion of the uh, sequencing information that's out there, it, it's very common to pick up a journal or a science article that, about new causes of diseases. And it's uh, uh, really testament to this setting the foundation for how we go about discovering genes. Um, so. Um, just to take a step back, and I wanted to spend just a couple minutes to talk about the, how, how we develop drugs. And, and so 
Uh, most of you are, are aware that the, the first step in this process really heavily relies on the basic research that's being done to identify targets uh, and then understand the biology of those targets. So you have uh, 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 proteins like Huntington uh, that was discovered uh, 25 years ago. Uh, and we're learning a lot about the, the protein, but there's still a lot of uh, mysteries and a lot, of, a lot more information that's needed to be found. Um, but it, it gives us a, a direct drug target because we know the protein causes the disease. So the thought is if we can lower the protein, that should have an impact on the disease. Uh, once we identify a target, the next step is what we call preclinical uh, testing, where we'll uh, screen for drugs that will bind or uh, modulate the protein or RNA of interest and test those in cell culture and animals. And then once we get some confidence that uh, the drug is doing what it should be doing, uh, we'll advance those into clinical trials. And uh, just wanted to highlight that there is a little bit more complicated than uh, uh, just going into clinical trials is that there's actually three different phases of clinical trials. Uh, phase one is generally the first in human trial. And the primary focus is on safety. So we're really just looking to see is the drug safe to administer to patients. Uh, you really aren't dosing long enough to see any kind of clinical effect, but it, uh, it is the, where you have to start uh, before you can run. Uh, a phase two study uh, has a larger number of patients, uh, and this is where you begin to start looking for signs of efficacy. It's still safety is the primary focus, uh, but you are looking for signs of efficacy. And then phase three is the large studies. Uh, generally, there are hundreds of patients, if not thousands, depending on the drug. Uh, that you're testing it in. And uh, that's where we really do focus, is the drug doing what it should be doing to, to treat a, a disease. So uh, it, it is unfortunately a, a, f a fairly long process. This, this can take anywhere from, uh, in the case of uh, Spinraza that I just showed, that was a five year uh, uh, from here to getting the drug approved. Uh, most drugs, that's actually a fairly accelerated timeline. Most drugs are five to 10 years and sometimes even longer. Uh, so it is, this takes some while. Uh, to be able to get the final approval of a drug. Um, and the reason I point that out is I want to put in perspective where we are in, in, in the process. So when we st first started working on uh, the Huntington, it was actually um, uh, some, uh, a project that we were working on with uh, Don Cleveland and CHDI was a, a key funder of the work that we were doing. And, and the goal was really trying to figure out a strategy. How do we use our technology to be able to uh, target the Huntington gene? And, and so we, we, we had a number of different uh, discussions. And one, one of the strategies was to uh, design an, an a antisense drug that would bind to the uh, uh, Huntington RNA, as well as the wild-type Huntington RNA, and bring in this enzyme that would uh, end up degrading uh, the RNA. And we call that to total Huntington ASO, and that it reduces both the wild-type and the mutant Huntington uh, there. Another strategy that we've been uh, looking at is that we have heterogeneity in our genome. So uh, even though we all have the same genes, there's subtle differences, generally one or two nucleotide differences between my gene and your genes out there. And with our technology, we can actually exploit that difference. And we can recognize a single nucleotide change between uh, 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 this gene and this gene. And so we can design an antisense drug that would bind to the mutant Huntington, but not the wild type Huntington. And that was very attractive to us, uh, uh, that we can cause a cleavage of the, of the uh, mutant Huntington uh, allele, or RNA that's produced off that, but not the, the wild type, and sort of leave the normal amount of uh, Huntington protein intact. The problem is that this would only treat about 40% of the patients out there uh, with one drug. And we could develop a second drug that would treat another 20 to 30% of the patients and another drug that would treat 10%. And before you know it, we'd have to develop eight or nine drugs to be able to treat all the Huntington patients in the world. Whereas this strategy allows us to treat all the Huntington patients uh, uh, throughout the world with a single drug. And so ultimately, after a lot of discussion with our partners, Roche, uh, on this as well as internally, we opted to go with this strategy uh, as, as a strategy to take into clinical trials. Um, and doing that, we found that um, uh, there was really no difference in the activity that we saw in mouse models. And, and there are a number of different mouse models of Huntington that uh, I don't really want to get into. This is just one example of a mouse model. And what you notice is that if we started treating here with the antisense drug, the mice actually started getting better. We didn't just stop the disease, but we improved symptoms. And again, you have to put this in perspective. It is a mouse model. It's not the human disease. Uh, but it was encouraging that the mice were getting better with treatment. And just to kind of highlight what this is, it's, it's called a rotorod test, which if you can imagine 
uh, it's a log rolling contest for mice. And you're actually measuring how long mice can uh, stand up on the log. And, and that reflects you know, their, both their muscle strength as well as their coordination. And so it's, it's commonly used in research, uh, uh, how, how long we do this. And actually, the researchers ought to have to do this as well uh, to be able to administer the test. Uh, but it is, uh, just think of it as the log rolling contest. And so you see that these mice are able to stay on the log a little bit longer than untreated mice uh, with treatment. So that was very encouraging. And there were a number of other studies that we did that ultimately led us to start a uh, clinical study. So what I'll share is just a little bit of the data from, from that uh, first clinical study uh, that we've done. Uh, this is, and I should have highlighted, these are all injectable drugs. So they have to use a needle. And in the case of Huntington, we're administering the drug into the cerebral spinal fluid that surrounds the, the brain at the base of the back. So it's basically a spinal tap. Uh, and I know that sounds horrible, but uh, it, it's very commonly used and, and uh, uh, well tolerated by the, the patients that were in, this, in the study. And so the patients were given four doses of the drug. Um, and it was called a dose escalation study. So the first group of patients were given 10 milligrams of drug. And there were about four patients that got that dose. We monitored them very carefully, looking for any safety signals. And again, this is the first time that we're ever exposing uh, an experimental therapy to patients. So they're monitored for another four months after the, the dose was done and uh, look, make, made sure the drug was safe. Then the next group of patients got 30, the next group 60, the next 90, and, and uh, 120. So it's a dose escalation study. Um, uh, it, I should point out that uh, Prior to dosing, because you are collect, you do have the, the uh, needle in the cerebral spinal fluid, you collect a little bit of that fluid. And we use it for two things. One is that we measure safety to make sure there's no safety signals uh, that are occurring that we can detect in cerebral spinal fluid. But importantly, as you'll see in the next slide, we're using it to document that the drug is doing what it should be doing. That is, it's reducing the mutant Huntington protein in CSF fluid, which reflects the mutant Huntington protein in the brain. And so what we've demonstrated is a uh, dose-dependent reduction. So with higher doses, we're seeing a lowering of the mutant Huntington protein. Each dot represents an individual patient, uh, and it shows the percent reduction that we see with the patients. And typical with the clinical trial, uh, there is heterogeneity. Not everybody responds the same way to this drug, uh, just like nobody responds uh, to many other drugs. But if you look at the average, it was very encouraging that we were seeing this dose-dependent reduction. Furthermore, we saw a time-dependent reduction. So first dose, second dose, third dose, uh, you, you see it starting to go down more and more. We expect this to plateau off after four to five doses, so it's not gonna just keep going down to zero, but uh, it should show uh, more robust uh, uh, reductions of the Huntington protein than what we see uh, today. And so what we're predicting based upon a lot of modeling is that a 40% reduction, which is here, would cause a 50 to 75% reduction in brain tissue. And so that's within the therapeutic range that we were seeing in the mouse models to produce the, the benefit that we saw in the mice. So we think we're, we have a dose that should be effective uh, uh, at this point. So um, just uh, as I said, this primary focus of the study was safety. And there were really no safety uh, signals in the study. The drug was very well tolerated at all the doses. And none of the participants discontinued from the study. And in fact, we, we now have what's called an open label extension study. So all the patients who participated in this study were uh, asked if they wanted to continue to receive the drug. And so they had to re-enroll in a new study where they're getting uh, the drug at the highest dose tested. And uh, all 46 patients did re-enroll. So uh, they are, uh, uh, you know, further evidence that there were no side effects that uh, are worth, uh, would keep people out of participating in a study like this. And as I mentioned, this is a relatively short-term study, and so we never expected to see any kind of uh, improvement in their symptoms at this stage, uh, and, and we didn't. Um, and so the, the thought is that you're going to have to treat for a longer period of time to really see improvements in, in symptoms of the patients. And so that brings me to what's next for this drug. Uh, you know, first off, our partners Roche licensed the drug and uh, you know, supported doing the extension study. And they're about ready to launch a phase three study uh, for this drug. So they're skipping phase two. Uh, they want to accelerate getting this drug to patients as quickly as possible. And given the data that we had based upon the safety and the fact that we were uh, engaging the target, that is that we were, the drug was doing what it should be doing, they're um, uh, really starting a, a phase three study. And it has, a, like all phase three studies, a fancy acronym called Generation HD uh, that uh, came out of this word. <laughs> 
Uh, they, they pay people a lot of money to do this, I should say. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, we're very excited to the study starting. And um, it uh, is a, a fairly large study, 660 participants uh, with 80 to 90 sites total in 15 countries throughout the world. So it will be a very big study. There are three arms to the study where uh, patients will get 120 milligrams of the drug monthly, 120 milligrams every other month, or the placebo monthly. And uh, will, all the patients who finish the study will then have the option of enrolling into an open label study where they will all get drug, even the placebo patients will get uh, the, the drug, um, it, it, as long as the drug is safe and, and no safety signals show up. Um, so, um, really, I just want to leave it here, I, I think, is that uh, this is not the end. It's, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, this is Winston Churchill's quote, I should mention, not mine. Uh, but really, uh, we're at the beginning of the, uh, it's the end of the beginning is where we are. So uh, there's still a lot more work to be done. And uh, just to kind of highlight, and uh, Dr. Tillman talked about this, uh, is that, uh, um, you know, we feel that IONOS HTTRX, uh, which has now got a Roche number, RG604 or for 2 uh, offers hope that Huntington may be a treatable disease. We haven't proven it yet, and so we still have to do that. Um, it's important um, because this is still very early that we continue to invest in developing other therapies. Uh, you know, I, I suspect that uh, we won't cure the disease. In fact, I'd be, uh, be astonished that we actually cure the disease. So it really is to be thought of as a treatment. And uh, to make the treatments more effective, it's important to keep investing in, in alternative treatments uh, to, to go forward. And um, to, to do that, we need to find additional drug targets. And Dr. Tillman already talked about some of the modifier genes that have been identified uh, that uh, HDF has been instrumental in, in helping to, to mine uh, to, to get those. And ultimately, our, our, our goal is uh, to continue with basic research to find uh, additional targets, as well as clinical and translational research. We need to do both. And so with that, I'll skip this, because uh, Dr. Tillman already talked about it. Um, but I uh, just wanted to thank the, the um, investigators who participated in, in the clinical trial. It was led by last year's honoree for uh, uh, the, the, the award, uh, Dr. Sarah Tabrizi. And uh, you may have heard her talk last year. She's much more dynamic than I am, uh, so uh, sorry. And then uh, finally, uh, my collaborators at, uh, uh, that were really instrumental uh, uh, at UCSD, Dr. Don Cleveland and Holly Kordasevich. Uh, 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 Sarah and Ed, uh, Michael Hayden's group uh, did some of the work, and, and CHDI was instrumental in funding, in particular Don, uh, Doug McDonald. And then the Hereditary Disease Foundation show, uh, deserves a lot of recognition for getting us here and, and helping, uh, helping us along the way. Then my colleagues at Roche and, and Ionis. Uh, thank you. So I'd, I'd love it if people had questions for either uh, Dr. Tillman or uh, Dr. Bennett. So. Raise your hand if you have a question. Yes, Daisy. Hi, that, both of the presentations were fantastic. Thank you so much for explaining things so well to all of us. Uh, Dr. Ben and I had uh, two quick questions. One is when, um, when the strategy is to target just the mutant Huntington allele and not both uh -huh. alleles, why does the, the, the um, therapy only work on about 40% of the people. Right. So it has to do with, um, we, there's heterogeneity in these, what's called single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are the single base change that occurs between uh, all of us. And uh, for a drug that targets a particular uh, um, uh, polymorphism, let's say it's an A, uh, the other 60% of the population will have a G at that site, and they won't be treatable. And so there is no single polymorphism that it links 100% with the mutant Huntington allele. And so we're, we're, we're playing a, a genetics game that there was some uh, diversity in, in, in our lineages that, that got us to where we are today. And, and some of those we can exploit, but unfortunately for Huntington's, it's not one that would be universal. We would only treat a subpopulation of the patients. Um, that, thank you for explaining that. Also, um, when are you expecting to start recruiting for this, um, 
the phase three? And um, are the sites that will be participating already listed somewhere? No, the sites aren't listed. They're, um, our, our partners, Roche, are responsible for this, so they're, they're, they're taking it on. Um, they're interviewing sites as, as we speak to see which sites want to participate, and then they go through a qualification for, for the sites to show that they have the, the staff and the infrastructure to be able to support the clinical trial. That's going on today. Um, we expect to open up some sites in the U.S. by the end of the year and perhaps start dosing you know, uh, either, uh, I suspect they'll, they'll start dosing patients at the beginning of next year, just wow. given the holidays, but the, it, it's, it's imminent. And uh, there's a, a, a website called clinicaltrials.org that you can look on to, and once there's a site that's, .gov, I'm sorry, uh, clinicaltrials.gov. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you can look onto, and once the site is active, they'll list there, and then they'll also list the coordinator who to contact to, uh, you know, if you wanted to participate in the study. Thank you. Sure. Great. Any other questions? Yes. Um, hi, Dr. Brennan and uh, Dr. Tillman. Thank you for uh, great presentations from both of you. Uh, my question is to um, Frank. And Frank, if you had a crystal ball, and I know you don't, but if everything went well with the ASO trial, when would you expect to see it approved? Yeah, so that, that is a crystal ball. And, and again, I just want to emphasize we're, we're still very early, so there's lots of uh, opportunity for things to go wrong, so I don't want to overpromise. But uh, the plan would be this trial uh, would take probably three to three and a half years to finish, and then... Uh, once it finishes and you get the data, if the data is positive, you would file with the regulatory agencies. I suspect, given the, the, the need for uh, therapies for Huntington's disease, the regulatory agencies will be very responsive and probably approve it within six months of uh, filing. So uh, generally it would take, after we got the data, it would take uh, three to four months to get all the data organized in a way that would allow filing, and then another uh, three to six months for approval. If uh, again, assuming everything went well. So we're probably talking four years, for a little over four years. Uh. Thank you, and again, thank you both for great talks. Um, could you comment, Frank, on uh, what level of uh, illness manifestations characterize the group that you preferably are going to work with this uh, drug on. Right. And so, then uh, maybe make a comment on if, let's say, hopefully things go well, how you then think of both mm -hmm. more serious people and perhaps people who don't even have the uh, right. manifestations yet. Yeah, so um, this clinical trial is in uh, early manifest HD patients, and I need Dr. Uh, uh, Young to explain to you what, what that means, but uh, it's... Uh, it's early, early stage patients will be in this trial. And I don't know if you want to uh, give, add some color to what. Oh, sure. Well, I mean, we uh, have ways of assessing people both in terms of um, standardized um, tests of the motor system as well as standardized tests of our, the way we think and put together thoughts. And, um, we know that there's a long period of time before you actually show the symptoms. Dr. Uh, Tillman showed that, where things are changing in the brain, but you haven't got overt symptoms yet. I think what they want for this trial is to get people who have just fallen into those early symptoms where you can just start to see motor right. abnormalities right. and not later than that because then you wouldn't be able necessarily to revive right. uh, dead neurons, but sick neurons, yes. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and so the plan is to go both directions. Uh, actually, uh, uh, you know, I think as Dr. Tillman pointed out, the, the future is really in prophylactic treatment. And so I, I really do see the pre-symptomatic uh, treatment as a direction that we'll head. Uh, but first we have to demonstrate the drug has some benefit to patients. Uh, and then also, I think we, we need to ask the question, what is the benefit in late-stage patients? Uh, and, and so I, I see that happening. And then finally, there's a juvenile patient population that, uh, again, I think we'll want to explore uh, at, at some point.
Hi, I have a question for Dr. Tillman. My daughter wanted me to ask this, so <laughs> she's so shy. Um, <laughs> but you talked about there's other genes that affect the onset of Huntington's disease, which is the first time I've heard that. Could you just talk a little bit more what other genes affect the onset? Um, there are, I think now, four or five that have been, how many, Tom? There are five? How many? Fourteen. Fourteen. Um, which is, which is uh, a, you know, a, a lot, but, but it's going to give scientists tremendous opportunities for two things, I think. One is, what do they tell us about the biological function of the HTT protein? And that matters a lot to Frank because were he to develop strategies that actually reduce the level of both the normal size protein as well as the mutant protein, it, it's possible that that could be deleterious for a whole entirely different reason that you're losing the activity of the wild type protein. So it, you know, there's so much that apparently is not known about what the normal biological function of HTT is. So I think it, these gene candidates are going to give us a lot of information about just the basic biology of what is going on. But then the really exciting thing, and I didn't emphasize this, so thank you for the question, um, which is that some of these, the variants actually prolong uh, the, the period before disease onset. So those are the ones you're really interested in, right? You want the ones that are actually ex uh, extending the, the time before symptoms occur. So if I were to prioritize those 14, that's where you would begin by prioritizing the ones that have the greatest impact on uh, extension of uh, normal function. Do you want to? No, I, I, I agree. It's uh, very exciting, and it gives us, not only us, but other companies as well, you know, further opportunity to have drugs that will impact the disease, and I think it's really critical. You know, the, 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 the one other thing that I would add, and, and this, may, <laughs> this may be more than you wanted to know, but one thing to remember is that this protein is made in every cell in our body. Yeah, now it's, it's, it's pathological effect when it's a mutated form is in neurons, but we don't know much about what it's doing elsewhere in the body, and it would be good if we knew that, actually. Um, the second is that what, what we do know about the protein, it appears to be a protein that, uh, for better uh, use of a word, is kind of a scaffold protein. It interacts with a lot of other proteins. It may be a protein that moves them around in the body or in the cell, inside the cell. But again, because we don't really know that, it's very hard to think about the impact of some of the kinds of therapies that could be considered. So these genes are, they're like clues, right? And, and, and it's wonderful to be able to have clues um, to function. Well, I just might add that uh, part of the structure of the workshop this weekend was to follow up on the exciting work that Nancy and David Hausman have been doing looking at modifier genes in the Venezuela group, mm -hmm. and they've come up with quite a few, and um, we spent uh, all of yesterday and uh, this morning Talking, talking about, about ways yeah. we can attack sure. those as drug targets. So, very. Yeah. Oh. And uh, I wanted to just ask you to comment on something that evolves from what you said, and that is: so we're seeing <clears throat> modifiers that can uh, alter the age of onset of Huntington's. What do we know about how many other brain diseases or other diseases may be subject to the same kind of benefit? Well, we, all of them are going to be. Yeah. I mean, to the extent that certainly of all the uh, neurodegenerative disorders, every one of them would fall into that category. Yes. Yeah, in, in fact, for SMA, we've been doing a lot of work looking at modifiers for SMA. And, and 
Uh, we've identified, we didn't, but a, a, a group in Germany identified a couple modifier genes that when we target them with our antisense oligos, we further augment the activity of uh, nusinersen. So it, it's clearly a, a therapeutic strategy that uh, I think the industry and we're, we're very interested in. And this is a question for you. So um, aren't there therapies that are either starting now to be tested in, um, in study participants to actually go in on some of the other chromosomes where they've found these SNPs or these small segments that actually do perhaps uh, that in, increase the progression of the disease faster in certain people than others who have the mutant gene? Mm -hmm where they're actually trying to turn those off. I think, I thought that there were a exactly, couple that are right. actually involved so, in the cutting and they're screwing up the cutting of the genes. Exactly, so, so the issue here is yes, there are genes that delay the age of onset further than you would expect just based on the CAG repeat number, and also genes that shorten it and make it earlier mm. age of onset than predicted. Now, both of those are drug targets, right? And we haven't started testing them in humans yet, but again, a bunch of people at this workshop this weekend have grants to look at these very issues in DNA repair enzymes that make it shorter onset, you know? So there's a lot of work and it's gonna be very exciting. So I'm going to say, look, everybody needs a drink and <laughs> talk to each other. This is great. Thanks, ladies.